Good morning. Uh, welcome to Hydrox webinar this morning. My name is Graham Monday. Um, I'm the marketing director for Hydrox. Uh, today we're talking about uh, turning air quality cost calculations into a financial positive. Um, this is a short, sharp webinar. Uh, we have three presenters. Um, you can post some questions uh, in the question box on your screen and we'll pick those up. Uh, and we'll deal with those at the end. We're going to run this for 45 minutes in total, uh, including questions. Um, let me briefly introduce you to our three speakers, and then I'll just give you a little bit of context before we get going. Um, so our three speakers today in the order that they'll speak um, is uh, Mark Nichols. Uh, Mark is an air quality engineer for Hydrock. Um, hello, Mark. Hi, how are you this morning? Very well, thanks, Graham. Good morning. Good, good morning. Now, Mark, just very briefly, you've had a fascinating piece of uh, academic research recently posted, haven't you? Um, tell us who that was with uh, and very briefly what it was about. Sure, so I had the pleasure of uh, co-authoring a research paper throughout lockdown uh, 1.0 that was in partnership with the University of Brighton led by Dr Kevin White uh, and the topic was on the changes we saw in atmospheric composition as a result of lockdown restrictions the first time around. So we all saw media headlines saying there was massive drops in nitrogen dioxide, which there were, but we delved in a little bit further into the science to see what the knock on effect for that might be for other pollutants and actually found some quite interesting changes, particularly with regard to ozone at ground level, which could be quite a, a severe pollutant for respiratory problems. Um, so, yeah, we found some interesting changes which we're looking to uh, expand upon with another research paper. So. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And and that paper indeed is actually on our website and, the, and there's a summary of the article as well um, on our website under articles if you want to go and have a look at it. Um, our second uh, presenter today is Lindsay Brown, uh, a uh, principal consultant in our smart energy and sustainability team. Lindsay, good morning. Uh, how are you? Good morning. Very well, thank you. Hi. And now, Lindsay, you're a classic example of this strangest of years of 2020, uh, where you and your partner have moved out of the city uh, and into the countryside. Um, how is it? What, what have you experienced and learned from that move? It's great. Lots of fresh air being the, the key theme here. Uh, some great walks and uh, yeah, it's lovely. Beautiful village. Really good, really good. And a lovely backdrop there as well, Lindsay. Um, and our third presenter today um, is James McKechnie. Uh, he is our National Director for our Transport Planning Team. Uh, good morning, James. Good morning, Graham. Good morning, everyone. Hi, how are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. I, I see bikes in the background on your wall there, <laughs> and I know you're a keen cyclist. You're a great networker, um, James. Um, in 2020, how has that been in terms of business relationships and, and networking? And dare I say, have you been out on the bike with clients? Um, so in terms of networking, I think we've done as much, if not more, um, than ever, really. People seem more available online, um, so there's been plenty going on. Um, and yes, indeed, I have been out on the bike. Um, not not in person with clients, um, but we've taken that, we run a um, cycle networking group, which we've taken online um, using Strava. Brilliant. OK, super. Thank you. Uh, Living Transport there is our Transport Director, James McKechnie. Um, right. So before we get going, I'm, I'm conscious there'll be a number of people um, on this webinar today who thought interesting subject admittedly don't know anything about Hydrox. So no corporate spiel here particularly, but very briefly, if you don't know us particularly well, uh, we're a UK consultancy specialising in the built environment. Uh, our focus is on sustainability, energy and engineering design. Um, and some key things that have happened to us very recently, last week, uh, one of our most prestigious projects, the WAVE uh, in Bristol, uh, which involved most of our practice areas, um, that won the Cultural and Leisure Project of the Year Award at the British Construction Industry Awards, which was fantastic. Um, English National Ballet in East London uh, is a project that our mechanical and electrical engineers have worked on um, and uh, was opened uh, late last year. Um, we partnered with Glen House Architects on that. Uh, An Architects Journal voted it Building of the Year this year, which is a fantastic accolade for everybody involved. And this week, um, our Cardiff team, um, a multidisciplinary team, uh, they were announced as Consultancy of the Year by Business Insider Wales uh, in the Property Awards, which was a fantastic achievement for them. Um, and if you're tuning in today and you're based in the Northwest and you get 
uh, Place Northwest, which is a, an online bulletin about all property news in the Northwest. And there's something quite interesting about Hydrock in that bulletin today, uh, which we will share on our social channels later on, that kind of, uh, I guess, emphasizes the personality of Hydrock as a business as well, a little bit different to other things you might see. So today, short and sharp, as we said, we're going to finish at 10.45. Uh, what is this all about? Government regulations place a, a financial uh, value on the impact of, uh, of, of emissions from new developments. DEFRA um, have, have, have changed some of the calculation of damage costs in recent times, uh, but you can reduce those cost uh, impacts to zero, and indeed you can actually find ways to create revenue. How do you do it? Our three presenters are going to talk to you about that, and we're going to start with Mark, um, who's going to set the perspective from an air quality uh, position. So Mark, over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Graham, and good morning, everybody. So the remainder of this webinar will be structured around first providing the context in terms of the health effects of air pollution. I'll then introduce the concept of damage costs before framing the second half of the webinar within the context of a Hydrock case study and presenting an overview of some potential mitigation options before handing over to Lindsay, who will delve deeper into smart energy, and then James, who will talk more from a travel and transport perspective. So starting with the health effects of air pollution, then these can range from acute short term effects to chronic long term effects with regard to short term exposure. So that's over hours or days. This can trigger adverse effects on lung function, such as coughing and wheezing and can exacerbate asthma and increase the number of respiratory and cardiovascular related hospital admissions. The main conditions associated with long term exposure are stroke, respiratory conditions such as asthma, cardiovascular disease and lung cancer and there is emerging evidence for associations with dementia, low birth weight and type 2 diabetes as well as susceptibility to more severe symptoms of COVID-19 as well. The UK's Clean Air Strategy 2019 provides some useful infographics which break down pollutants by source and impacts on an individual basis. So on the top left, you can see that 34% of total NOx, a part of which is nitrogen dioxide in the UK, comes from road transport. And at the curbside, this rises to 80%. For primary PM2.5, there are a wider range of sources and road transport accounts for approximately 12% of total particulates, as shown in the bottom left of the screen. The health impacts attributed to particulates can be quite severe as it can enter the bloodstream, the lungs and be transported around the body and embed into our organs. We've probably all seen the statistic in the top right that the combined effect of these two pollutants equates to somewhere between 28 and 36,000 premature deaths in the UK each year. To put this into context, Public Health England estimated that in 2017, the cost of this burden on the NHS and social care services was approximately 42.8 million, predicted to rise to 1.6 billion pounds up to 2025 for nitrogen dioxide and particulates combined. So it's that cost really which leads us on to the concept of damage costs, which are representative estimates of the external costs associated with a marginal change in polluting emissions. They have been developed by DEFRA to enable proportionate analysis of relatively small impacts on ambient air quality, such as those associated with new developments. They are a set of monetary impact values in pounds per tonne and represent the estimated value of the health burden on society for a change in emissions. So damage costs are available for five different pollutants, namely NOx, particulates, sulfur dioxide, volatile organic compounds and ammonia. The most recent costs were published in July of this year, so are quite recent, and the update follows updated guidance and evidence from the Committee on the Medical Effects of Air Pollutants and Public Health England. The effects of long term exposure on mortality rates are the dominant pathway captured in, in the revised costs, but this effect is captured alongside other pathways such as those associated with acute exposure as well. Damage costs are provided for a range of different sectors. For sulfur dioxide, VOCs and ammonia, there are national average values. For NOx and particulates, there are costs for a bigger range of sectors, which helps the appraisal to calculate site specific damage costs, including for road transport schemes, rail, aviation, industry, agriculture and so on. This webinar focuses on solutions for road transport, 
which can be broken down even further by location and conurbation size. It's important to note that PM 2.5 is the preferred metric in the revised cost for particulates, whereas previously this was PM 10, due to PM 2.5 being relatively more harmful. On the screen there at the bottom are the low, central and high scenarios for the road transport average costs, where low and high represent the uncertainty ranges, but we tend to deal with the central scenario. You can see that for NOx, the pound per tonne is £9,066, and for PM2.5, which is more harmful, the pound per tonne is £81,518. This is based on the baseline 2017 prices, but each appraisal applies uplift and discount factors depending on the year of assessment, which reflect an estimate of society's willingness to pay for health outcomes. So the impacts of air pollution and the action required to address them are highly relevant to local government priorities, such as health, housing, transport and quality of life. So strategic decisions on these issues all contribute to the quality of air that people breathe. And this goes some way to explaining why damage costs are increasingly common in development planning. With this in mind, damage costs are usually calculated during REBA stage three, when the planning application is being prepared, and typically we would calculate damage costs for a five year appraisal from the development opening year. They are most commonly calculated based on the polluting traffic footprint of a development as assessed by the transport consultants and result in a financial cost to the developer to mitigate air quality impacts from their schemes. From experience, these costs can be unexpected and certainly have the potential to be high for larger schemes. And for that reason, can be viewed as a barrier to development and a constraint rather than actually an opportunity to future proof and deliver environmental benefits. It should be noted that where the cost of mitigation cannot be itemised during REBA 3, they may be a matter for REBA 4 through condition. However, and this is a point that James will expand upon later, but rather than acting retrospectively, ultimately the best mitigation measure is to consider the air quality impacts of a scheme at REBA stage 2 and plan to bring the polluting traffic footprint associated with development down and really encourage modal shift towards active travel and alternatives to conventional car use. Because ultimately, when talking about road transport, the lower the traffic footprint, the lower the damage cost will be. So this slide shows a few examples of the types of local guidance which are being adopted across the country. And I need to stress that this is not exhaustive and I don't want the takeaway from this slide to be to avoid developments in these areas in order to avoid damage costs, but rather to illustrate that this type of assessment is increasingly common to avoid incremental worsening of ambient air quality, including in the southeast, the north, the midlands, and this chatter about them becoming a part of the emerging air quality positive approach in the new London plan as well. While these examples are guidance, there are also examples of new and emerging local plans enforcing them by including a policy which states that air quality assessment must be produced in accordance with the locally adopted planning guidance. So to introduce a hydro case study, and you'll appreciate the finer specifics have been removed, but we are working on a multidisciplinary project at the moment whereby we have a proposed residential development in the southeast of England, providing approximately 500 new homes. The polluting traffic footprint associated with this scheme has been calculated to be a net increase of approximately 2,500 daily movements on the road network, roughly equating to two trips in and two trips out per dwelling. Over a five year appraisal, this equates to an increase of approximately 1.6 tonnes of NOx per year and 0.13 tonnes of PM2.5 per year, as calculated using DEFRA's Emissions Factor Toolkit, resulting in a damage cost in the region of £100,000. This value, according to local guidance, must be ring fenced for air quality mitigation measures and other local policies, such as existing parking standards, which require a minimum of 20% electric vehicle charging infrastructure, for example, do not count against the cost. So what are the options? Is this a barrier? Does it reduce development profit margins or is it actually an opportunity to generate revenue and to future proof your scheme? To really make a difference, we have to find ways to innovate and go above and beyond. As previously mentioned, implementing initiatives which bring the polluting traffic footprint of a scheme down are the best way to mitigate against damage costs. For example, this may be through provision for car club schemes. 
incentivizing active travel, facilitating e-micro mobility such as electric bikes and scooters, and also in some instances green infrastructure which helps to reduce exposure are all effective measures. It is worth noting that the preference is always to mitigate on site within a scheme as opposed to offsetting. However, from experience, it may not always be possible to fully mitigate, particularly where the damage cost is quite high. And in these circumstances, any remaining balance may be sought by the local authority via a Section 106 agreement in order to contribute to their own air quality improvement initiatives locally. However, Hydroc have a multidisciplinary offering which we feel can really help clients with mitigating these costs and can even result in a revenue stream. So I'll now hand over to Lindsay, who is going to talk about electric vehicle charging infrastructure and renewable fuel generation, before handing over to James to expand further on some of the ideas I've introduced from a transport perspective. Thanks, Mark. So smart energy can be synonymous with a number of things. In this instance, the smart part is turning an energy asset into a revenue stream, offsetting the damage cost and providing an income for years to come. So why electric vehicle charging and renewable energy? Simply put, because both are sustainable and are free from the harmful emitters that damage costs are calculated from. Unlike traditional heat and power generation that requires the combustion of fossil fuel, renewable technologies produce energy from sustainable sources. Electric vehicles are also a key damage cost mitigation method because NOx, CO2 and particulate matter from the burning of petroleum is not present. By pairing both and charging EVs with renewable power, you can create a truly sustainable system, eliminating the grid carbon factor for operational energy and making this form of transport zero carbon with no negative impact to air quality. So now we know why they are the mitigation methods, I will briefly explore how deployment of renewables and electric vehicle charging can turn an expense, the damage cost, into a profit. It should be noted here that there are a, a number of key benefits to the deployment of renewables and electric vehicle charging, namely creating a sustainable circular economy, working towards achieving a net zero carbon site and future proofing for the full electrification of heat as well as transport. So using our example of a 500 unit residential development with 100k bill for damage costs, we explored what level of offset can be achieved using this total as our baseline. So what does 100k buy? 100k buys 500 solar panels, 30 air source heat pumps, 143 7 kilowatt chargers, a single 20 kilowatt wind turbine or 40 super fast 22 kilowatt public chargers. So as Mark stated, where a minimum requirement for say 20% EV charge points is deployed across the site's total number of car parking spaces, and noting that the same 20% does not count against the damage cost mitigation, the installation of 143 smaller charger points would provide an additional 28% to the site allocation, bringing the total to almost 50%. Alternatively, installing super fast chargers at strategic locations across the site would offer wider access to all of the residents, as well as provide a service to the public. I'll look at this in more detail in the next slides. So for PV, assuming a 12 panel roof allocation, 500 panels could cover the roofs of 40 homes, and that would provide an 8% reduction in emissions when compared to the same energy being provided from the grid. Alternatively, the panels could form a ground mounted array and provide a power output that could be used in a number of smart ways and to provide a return on investment. This is the same for the wind turbines and heat pumps. So how do you turn an energy asset into a revenue generator? The easiest way to make a return on investment is by selling energy, and that's either to a customer or to the national grid as a balancing service. Subject to your company size, the site demand and level of interest in asset ownership, there are a number of ways to achieve a payback. The first is by installing a microgrid or private network on site. This can be owned and operated by a developer and existing ESCO, which is an energy services company, or by a mixture of both through a joint venture and profit share arrangement. Note here that any participant selling electricity electricity at a demand less than 2.5 megawatts would actually be exempt from requiring a license to sell power and that's under section 6 of the Electricity Act, meaning that you don't have to be a part of the big six to trade energy. So once the microgrid has been installed, a PPA or power purchase agreement would be set up. 
This is a contract that provides security of supply at an agreed rate. So for example, you can generate free electricity from wind or solar PV and then sell it to an end user at a fixed cost for a fixed demand. The pence per kilowatt would be competitive with industry rates, but offer cheaper, and that would be to provide a better deal for the end user and secure the contract. The key to providing a resilient system here would be by adding battery storage to the microgrid. Um, that would ensure energy security and enable more control of the system. Batteries also enable entry into various energy markets, providing flexibility for frequency response, reserve services and the capacity market. It is true that often these systems can be expensive, but these costs can be recovered to provide a sensible payback as well as generate a secure revenue stream. If a, profits cap if a project's capital expenditure doesn't allow for full ownership of the assets, however, then there is an alternative and that's partnering with a third party. There are a number of companies which operate here, providing different options for owning and operating the energy system. This includes a fully funded system with zero capex for the developer and a share of the revenue. So using EV charging as an example for a standalone system, let me demonstrate this. So using the 100k damage cost to purchase 40 super fast 22 kilowatt EV chargers, you could expect a simple payback of less than a year against the entire system. Any use thereafter would be profit. So over five years, rather than have spent 100k on damage costs, you could earn a profit of over 630k. And this, and this uses electricity from the grid. So you can only imagine the opportunity it presents when you incorporate a renewable energy system that provides free electricity to power the chargers. So using the grid electricity scenario to demonstrate how payback can be achieved, we'd use an electricity import price of 12 pence per kilowatt hour. So you'll see in the image above that the price range at which electricity for EV charging retails at about 35 pence per kilowatt for this system. Assuming a four hour time charge per bay, so that's about one full charge per day for each of the 40 chargers, you would pay five pound per charger to the grid, so a total of 200 pounds per day. By selling this power at the retail rate of 35 pence per kilowatt hour, at a cost of 15 pounds per four hour charge to the end user, a profit of 10 pound per charger per day would be made. This is 400 pounds a day, 46,000 pounds at year one, which is after the full cost of the system is paid for, and 146,000 pounds a year thereafter. So totaling 630,000 pounds after five years. This profit could be further increased if the power was sourced from on-site renewable power generators, um, such as PV or wind, whereby the 12 pence per kilowatt grid charge would be zero pence, providing 100% profit. A battery storage system would also maximise this utilisation further. So this example uses the same principle as the private wire and PPA scenario previously discussed. And a fully funded electric vehicle charging array could also be sought from a third party with a share of the revenue agreed. Now, ideally, the revenue generated from an energy system would be used to further increase the deployment of renewable energy systems across a site or future developments, increasing the reduction of harmful emissions and working towards a net zero carbon future. Hopefully, this high level overview has provided an insight into how the value of a damage cost mitigation method can be fully realised. I'll now pass over to James for how we might think differently about transport in relation to air quality damage costs. Thank you, Lindsay. As we've heard from Mark, damage costs are considered after the bulk of the technical assessment work for a planning application has been completed, typically at REBA stage three. I'm going to show how a different way of looking at transport and access through the transport assessment and travel plan during REBA stage two can minimise air quality impacts. Predict and provide is the assessment and mitigation of traffic impacts by predicting future traffic based on existing survey data and providing road capacity to accommodate it. Of course, this serves to create the same or greater levels of traffic than have typically arisen in the past, along with the, the expensive mitigation needed to accommodate those vehicles. The 1998 transport white paper abandoned the approach as unsustainable. So why is it still so commonly adopted? and what alternative approach might we take? Alongside government policymakers, academics and a growing band of professionals, Hydrock believes in decide and provide. Deciding on the future that we want, 
and providing the means to deliver it. If you change people's circumstances, you will change their responses. This has become more evident in recent years, not just because of the COVID pandemic, but also due to changing attitudes in response to the climate emergency. These system shocks prompt rapid changes in behaviour. Resilience is more important than ever. <clears throat> and this has highlighted something which the industry already knew, but probably didn't do enough about. It's no longer about transport. Motor transport remains part of the bigger picture, but accessibility is what we actually need. And there are two other strands to that. Proximity and access by sustainable modes of transport, which relates largely to spatial planning, and also communications and technology, which has enabled many of us to carry on with our working and social lives during the pandemic. As mentioned, transport assessments are usually based on what has happened before. Consequently, they predict more of the same or, given government traffic growth predictions, worse. Policy allows us to change that. There is nothing in the National Planning Policy Framework, Local Authority or High Was England documents which says you can't look at things differently. In fact, a more evidence-based and vision-led approach is common for our largest and most strategic developments, such as new communities. Why not do the same for all developments? Evidence is rapidly developing in relation to COVID impacts, some of which we believe will become embedded in the future. For example, how many of us were camera shy when we started using Teams or Zoom at the beginning of the first lockdown? We've become a lot more comfortable with communication technology. Before the second lockdown, traffic was close to pre-COVID levels in some parts of the country. However, the overall picture is one of a reduction in traffic and people are traveling more flexibly to avoid the traditional peak hours. The COVID crisis has led to huge increases in walking and cycling, both for commuting and recreation. Government funding seeks to embed some of those behaviours, as do new design standards. With trains carrying around 35% of normal passenger numbers and buses at 60%, some usual train or bus users are now driving, temporarily inflating traffic figures. However, rail operators report that some summer services were at capacity, whereas commuter services remain lightly used. This may suggest that changes in employment patterns are as relevant as commuter confidence in using public transport. During the first lockdown, 47% of all UK employees did some work from home, of which 86% was as a result of the pandemic. The picture will vary across sectors, being focused on office workers and others that can remain productive away from their usual workplace. We have to take account of this. The tools are already available to us, and it's time for the industry to step away from old practices. After all, we may not have perfect visibility of the future, but we can be certain that basing our predictions on the old normal can only be wrong. As I've mentioned, policy and guidance already allow us to think differently. A simple way of doing this is to take account of the positive impacts of travel plans when predicting traffic. After all, travel plans are required because authorities believe that they can have a positive impact. Our research shows a potential 10 to 15% reduction in car trips. They also cost money to write and implement. The industry and highway authorities often overlook the guidance which tells us that traffic prediction is iterative. A simple example is, firstly, to predict traffic levels without the benefits of the travel plan. Then, reduce traffic to re reflect agreed travel plan measures. And finally, to reassess the impact of the development and its mitigation in a travel plan scenario. After all, travel plans are required for most major developments. It can only be right for their positive effects to be accounted for in the transport assessment. Travel plan measures are also usually a fraction of the cost of physical mitigation. We've talked about the seismic shifts in how we work and exciting new technologies which influence weather and how we travel, but let's not forget the basics. Walking and cycling remain key means of low cost sustainable transport. The increase in e-bikes and scooters around our cities and towns effectively flattens hills and compresses space especially for people that are less able to undertake strenuous exercise. We are convinced that future-proofing master plan layouts for high levels of EG charging, EV charging provision, shared and autonomous mobility is not only necessary, but can also be a positive sales point for, de for developers. 
Evidence shows that well-designed places are more highly valued, and the things which we value increasingly reflect our environmental and lifestyle choices. Those lifestyle choices are exemplified by the decreasing levels of car ownership and license holding amongst younger people. We've discussed working patterns. The office is far from dead, but how and how often we use it has likely changed forever. Research shows that around half of office workers now working from home enjoy the lack of a commute. The Future Forum found that only 12% of knowledge workers wanted to return to the old way of working, with 72% wanting to work a hybrid remote office model going forward. Our own research points to a majority of office workers wanting to work from home at least a few days per week. People have seen a different way and they're enjoying it. The impact on peak hour commuting will be significant. All of this needs to be accounted for in our assessments. After all, we've never actually hit government traffic growth predictions, so why should we plan for traffic increases that don't materialise? So, let's use the policies, evidence and tools at our disposal to decide on the future that we want. In our master planning work, we've been looking, for looking to the future for some time, embedding good travel behaviours, emphasising the 20 minute neighbourhood, building in local mobility and work hubs, and looking at how fundamental shifts in vehicle technology will affect the street scene. Data is going to drive the future. We're using data to start from first principles and to evidence how we're going to deliver the places that we want, rather than just more of the same development, environmental and social issues. A majority of local authorities have now declared a climate emergency. What we are doing recognises that existing and emerging evidence enables our industry to stop over-predicting, over-providing and over-mitigating for traffic. The new transport planning delivers an evidenced vision for the future, reduces spend for government and private developers and optimises development in terms of air quality, noise and energy impacts. Linking transport and air quality appraisal work earlier in the design processes reduces damage costs from the outset. Thinking differently about the evidence base enables us to further minimise development traffic. Providing for current and emerging sustainable modes of travel plays a key role in offsetting air quality impacts as part of damage cost mitigation measures. I hope this part of our seminar has been useful in showing the potential for transport assessment and design work to, minim to minimise and mitigate air quality impacts and to influence the delivery of places which meet our view vision for the future. So just to summarise then what we've discussed this morning, the external value of health impacts associated with incremental worsening of ambient air quality from new developments are quantified through damage costs. The best way to mitigate is to reduce the polluting traffic footprint of new schemes and early consideration through design is key to this. Deployment of renewables and electric vehicle charging are mitigating methods against damage costs. Used in a smart way, they can offset the damage costs, generate a revenue stream and provide an opportunity for investment in future renewable energy projects. Damage costs are an increasingly common requirement for planning, presenting an opportunity to innovate and future-proof. So I'd like to thank everyone for listening and now I shall hand back to Graham Monday, who will sum up our discussions and chair the Q&A session. Thank you, the three of you. Uh, that was really good. Thank you. We we have a number of questions uh, that have come in, uh, which we'll cover in, in 10 minutes and then we will finish on time at uh, 10.45. Now, Mark, um, you said to me beforehand, I don't think anyone will ask me a question. <laughs> um, so here we go. This is for you. Probably the first two, actually, I certainly want to cover here. Um, the first one is from Anna Gillings. Hello, Anna. Um, uh, she says, um, I understand the damage costs are dated 2017. Is there an updated version for 2020? And how often is it updated? Is it subject to indexation? Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Anna, for that question. So the example that I provided on the slide was the 2020 update damage costs, where the baseline to the damage costs is the 2017 base price. So when we are doing a damage cost calculation, we set that base year as the year that we are doing the appraisal and start the appraisal from the development's opening year. So this accounts for uplift factors and discount factors such as willingness to pay for health, health outcomes. So that 2017 example 
was the base price from the 2020 update. So I hope that helps to clarify things for you. Now, Mark, don't go away uh, because I'm going to post this question to you as well before we move on to James and Lindsay. Um, sure. There was then another question about why aren't damages uh, expanded into the construction phase? Uh, very good question. Um, there are certainly ways to account for construction. So for example, when we're talking about road transport, we can add in construction phase traffic to that calculation to account for vehicle movements. Um, but with regard to dust and and other emissions associated with construction, I believe there are other ways and other guidance approaches to actually going about mitigating these. And there's certainly lots of examples of best practice guidance from the Institute of Air Quality Management and the Greater London Authority that can effectively bring construction phase impacts in terms of dust down to basically negligible. Um, so there are certainly ways to account for construction traffic through the damage cost approach, but there are other ways to account for dust emissions through construction assessments uh, following other guidance. OK, thank you. Um, and this question I'm, I, is a kind of bit of a combo between uh, Mark and James, and we I think we have covered this, but let's just make the point for, for the people who've asked it. The question was, should a travel plan count against uh, the cost? Uh, Mark or James, I'm not quite sure which one of you wants to take that question. So I, I can just answer it initially and then James can potentially follow up. So my understanding from, so I shared the slide on the local guidance documents where these damage cost approaches are being enforced. Um, what they say are the costs associated with travel plan measures don't count against the damage cost mitigation package. However, a travel plan that's thought through at a much earlier stage, and this is where James can uh, expand upon, would reduce the damage cost inherently by reducing the polluting traffic footprint before travel plan then counts against any, any remaining costs. But yeah, the costs of a travel plan after the fact don't count towards offsetting mitigation from the guidance that I've personally read so far. James, did you want to come in there as well? Thanks, Graham. Yeah, Mark is absolutely right on that point. Um, and, and the point I would add is that um, policy enables us to take account of the positive impact of the travel plan through the transport assessment. And, and it's surprising how rarely that actually happens. OK, thank you. Um, James, stick with us and then Lindsay will come to you in a second. Uh, ben Christian from Vale Williams. Hello, Ben. Uh, glad you could join us. Um, uh, ben asks, um, you say that policy and guidance allow us to think differently. Uh, do the local highway authority officers allow this? Thanks, Ben. That's that's a really good question. Um, the, the answer is, is yes. I mean, the general approach has been taken for, for many years in relation to some of the largest um, urban extension sites, those sorts of things, new towns and villages. Um, so, so the approach um, of, of starting from first principles is well established uh, and I think it's even more valid with the sorts of changes that we're seeing um, in travel behaviour right now and actually it's it's set out um, in the MPPF um, in high risk England guidance for example that, um, that a first principles and iterative approach you know taking account of travel plan measures for example as I've said is completely legitimate OK, thank you. Um, Lindsay, I did promise we would come to you. A um, couple of questions here. The first one, um, for the suggested um, electric vehicle charging options, um, how confident can we be um, on the long term security of revenues uh, from commercial charging systems? Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, the, the rollout of EVs is only going to continue to rise. Um, it's actually estimated at approximately 40 million vehicles um, over the next 10 years. Um, so there should be confidence in, in that in, in itself. But, but over 50% of EV charging um, is actually uh, deemed to be undertaken at home. So the remaining is either via public um, like public charges at destination routes or while you're traveling um, or undertaken at work, for example. So half of that, there's there's an opportunity there, I think, for some of the public charges which we used in the example within the presentation. Um, I'd say additionally that 
something like revenue stacking would be an option here as well. So that is whereby you would introduce other systems to form part of that, in this instance, EV. So linking it up to um, kind of a PV or wind um, and using battery storage as well. And that would enable you to um, enter into a number of different uh, markets or revenue streams to really provide security of supply there. OK, thank you, Lindsay. Um, Mark, I might ask you to just kickstart the next question, if I may, but then um, guide us as to whether James or, or Lindsay need to come in as well. Um, the question here is that your main mitigation proposals um, cut carbon rather than particulate matter. Um, what measures would you recommend that would cut PM and generate an income for the developer? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I mentioned just before the webinar actually started that obviously when we're talking about electric vehicle charging in particular, there are particulate matter emissions associated with these through brake and tyre wear. Um, and so, but the point is that reducing the polluting traffic footprint from conventional uh, vehicles reduces the damage cost. Um, ways to avoid it is obviously to think about these things much earlier and avoid car use altogether where we can think about uh, accessibility as james has talked about um, and talking about alternatives encouraging public transport encouraging active travel and these these things as well all help towards reducing that damage cost i appreciate the point that there are particular emissions associated with evs but on the revenue generation point, probably hand back to Lindsay, who's the expert in that, to expand a little bit further. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the particular matter which I'd used in this assessment, um, which made the, the EVs viable for damage costs, was actually in relation more so to um, the burning of, of the fossil fuel or the petroleum, rather than the actual um, kind of uh, matter from the tyres. Um, but yeah, I appreciate that that is still an area that does need improvement. Uh, the key focus here is around um, reducing kind of emissions from operational energy um, as part of the EV system. Um, and that also um, ties in well with uh, the renewable energy as well. So any emissions that are created from, from the creation of energy, um, including petrol. OK, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, Mark, you're not getting off scot-free here. Um, <laughs> Monica Lumsden from RLB. Um, thank you, Monica, for this. Um, says, thanks for answering the question on construction. Um, do you think the PM 2.5 damages uh, can be included into the embedded carbon calculations? I don't know whether I'm putting you on the spot there with that question. <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit, Graham. I'm not involved in carbon <laughs> calculations personally. Again, that might be something for Lindsay to answer. Who I think I was going to say, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> have, Hiya, we put, yeah. <laughs> have we put you on the spot, yeah. Lindsay? No, that's fine. Um, so we do actually have, as part of our um, wider um, smart energy and sustainability team, we do have um, dedicated uh, specialists that do look at and body carbon assessments as well as life cycle carbon. Um, kind of costings as well. So this would definitely be more geared for them. Um, but uh, yes, it would, um, we, we would focus on, um, I'm sorry, we can convert it to a um, CO2 equivalent for the, for the, um, so we convert it to a CO2 equivalent for, for the embodied carbon. So it would be considered. Okay, thank you. One final question, and it's going to go to James. We'll be pleased to know. <laughs> um, where parking guidance for planning requires uh, electric vehicles. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm asking the wrong question. I do apologise. James, do you actually think we are overcompensating on traffic mitigation measures? This is the question. Sorry, James. Do you actually think we're overcompensating? Um, thank, thanks, Graham. Um, yes, the, the short answer is, is yes, I, I believe so. And um, it's slightly alarming, actually, um, for, for UK PRC um, when, you, when you see relatively little consideration of the things I've discussed, for example, in traffic predictions for major highway infrastructure, um, the result being potentially induced traffic. 
OK, thank you. Um, right. Um, it's 10.45. We said we would finish at 10.45 uh, and we will. Thank you so much uh, to Mark, Lindsay and James for the session today. Thank you for all your questions. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't actually get to all of them. Uh, and We'll have a conversation offline about some of the other questions that have come in uh, and whether we can give you some very short answers to some of those uh, that have been posted. So thank you so much for that. Um, our next uh, event and next webinar that Hydrock are hosting is on the 26th of November. Uh, we have a panel of experts, predominantly in Northern England, uh, talking about battery storage. So we're sticking with energy in particular as a theme. Uh, we're talking about battery storage uh, and how it can make uh, development sites viable. Um, so that is an event. It's a panel discussion uh, on the 26th of November. There are details on our website, uh, but if you particularly want to know more about it, then you can email us at events at hydrock.com and either myself uh, or one of the marketing team will respond to you. But thank you very much for your company today. Uh, thank you to our panellists um, and I hope you have uh, a great rest of the day. Thank you.